we are welcoming today to our Ubuntu Talks, a very distinguished South African intellectual and scholar, Professor Murketi Letzeka. Professor Letzeka is the holder of the UNESCO Chair of Open Distance Learning at the University of South Africa. University of South Africa is a university of more than 400,000 students, the largest university in South Africa. <clears throat> Professor Letzeka is a very well-known person, having his roots in research at the uh, our prestigious Human Sciences Research Council, where he was a senior uh, research specialist. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, he has published widely. Uh, he has published over 100 publications in journal articles and chapter contributions in scholarly books. Of particular interest to us tonight is his one publication, uh, which is Open Distance Learning Through the Philosophy of Ubuntu. And we've asked uh, Professor Letzeka to come tonight to speak to us from his heart about his understanding of Ubuntu and how in the post-COVID world, uh, Ubuntu can play a role in helping us to reclaim our humanity, which we seem to have lost along the way as humankind. So, Professor Letzeka, welcome. It's wonderful to have you. Thank it's you. an honor to, to have you here. And I will invite you to, uh, to present your ideas, and then we will have a conversation. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, what I want to do, basically, is to take maybe the few slides <clears throat> to talk about, just to give a brief uh, background about myself. Mm. I think it's important that uh, when you talk to people, they know who you are, where you are coming from, what shapes the person that you are. And I'm trying to get the, the slides up. Right. Next. <clears throat> you want the next slide? Yeah, I've sent I've sent a prompt. <laughs> okay. The, this is a picture uh, that Prof. Volmig will be mostly familiar with. <clears throat> this is a picture of a, a typical black township in South Africa, whether you are in Gauteng, whether you are in, in Durban, or whether you are in Cape Town. The apartheid system created such inequalities that there, there were distinctions in terms of residential areas. I was born in a black township just south of Johannesburg um, called Katleho in a city, a small town called Jimston. So this is, this is me and, and usually the township is mainly uh, associated with, with poverty, with congestion, with unemployment, but worst of all with violence. Um, and people try to act a living is the way the apartheid system creates. When you deprive people of resources, you, you, you take the humanity out of them and then you create conditions that are untenable, that are uninhabitable. And I grew up in this environment, however, <clears throat> I don't see the township where I grew up just as townships all over. I don't see them as hives of violence. I see them as places where people's characters and personalities are shaped. Um, townships constitute our, our lived experiences if you have to go the sociological routes. Uh, they represent who we are. Yeah. When I was six years of age, I was then moved <clears throat> to Lesotho, and 
I'd like to see the next slide. I was then moved to Lesotho, <clears throat> and I will have to explain again, Prof. Volmik, that was 1964. That date is very special because it was it was the year, I think, just before or after the conclusion of the, the Rivonia trial. Nelson Mandela and a lot of leaders who were in the NC had been charged with high treason. And I think the, the sentencing was due in June. Um, and um, our parents, who were originally from Lesotho, decided, rightfully so, that South African schools were probably not going to be functional. There was going to be a lot of violence with the leaders being bundled over to Robben Island. So we were moved to Lesotho. I, I then left the township and went to Lesotho. These are the pictures of Lesotho. I actually lived in first houses, the houses that you see. <laughs> this is mm. where I grew up. I grew up in a village and I grew up in this environment. But there's, there's a beauty. Lesotho is a, is a subsistent farming community. So we, we plow, as you can see, fields of corn. Just yesterday, uh, I have a farm in Lesotho. And just yesterday, I rolled out tractors to plow my farm. And next week, there's going to be a lot of activities. But Lesotho is also a beautiful, a beautiful country. On your extreme right is the Malitsunyan Fall. It's, um, it's our, our idea of, of Victoria Falls. It's just one fall. <laughs> but it's the beauty that says, if you go to Lesotho, you must go to Malitsunyan. And the, the, the bottom picture, every Lesotho boy grows up looking after animals. I grew up as a head boy. And every year in November, December, up to March, the animals are moved from the lowlands and we go to the mountains. It's a transhumans because the lowlands has been plowed. We get caught up in snow sometimes. So we are constantly subjected to the harsh realities. But the conditions in Lesotho as they are, are in, I think they became a very useful <clears throat> um, formative period for me because they exposed me to the community life. I, I This is where, when I started doing my studies on Ubuntu and I started talking about communal interdependence. I experienced that in Lesotho. Lesotho is a, is a community. Everywhere you go, it's rural communities and people there have Ubuntu in many ways. Next slide. <clears throat> Very interesting. In 1976, again, I'll keep referring to Prof. Volmik. In 1976, mm -hmm. the South African schools went up in smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, the student riots, the student protest against the imposition of apartheid. I was 19 years of age and I I, I worked in the mines. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I left Lesotho and got myself recruited by what was then called um, the Native Recruiting Council, NRC. Mm -hmm. I was recruited. I went to work in the mines as a 19-year-old. I went to the mine in Caltonville called Western Areas Gold Mine, just next to Rustenbeck. No, sorry, to Ranfontaine. And I had just passed my junior certificate with a first class, and they wanted to make me a clerk, but there was no money, so I opted to go underground, and they had to train me. So I was a winch driver. The grains that you see all over the place, underground they are called winches, so I was a winch driver. Mm. I think the mining experience also taught me something. I, I can... I can speak about how the apartheid system uh, created seclusions where they separated families, men, and put them in the mines. And migrancy, Professor, the late Professor Jeff Guy was my history teacher at the National University of Lesotho, and he took us through the whole study of migrancy and how migrancy disrupts the social fabric, the family structure. It removes men away from their homes. They go and spend years away because they need money so that they can sustain the family. But at a structural level, migrancy is disruptive. It breaks families. It brings so many things. I was part of that. I was a lanky 19-year-old, but I worked underground for a whole year. I always went down the shaft at 4 a.m., go underneath, and I'll be up at 2. It's, it's a life. It's a life that shaped me. Right. Next slide. <clears throat> When I spoke um, last time, I made reference to the United Nations. I still refer to them here. Um, that I went, I then went to university. Um, I'm a very fortunate person. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed because I studied 
at the National University of Lesotho. And then I went to Jobek to do my master's in education at VETS. And then I proceeded in 1995 to go to the Institute of Education at the University of London, where I did an MPhil in philosophy, Master of Philosophy. And then I came back to complete my PhD with the So even though I come from the township, even though I spent some time in Lesotho as a head boy, even though I worked in the mines, I look back at those experiences. I am a fulfilled person and I'll come back to why am I where we are. So I am grateful that the world has been good to me. I'm grateful that I came from those conditions, but I was able to rise out of that. The mining experience was useful for me because it allowed me to go to the mines, work so that I can get money to pay for my Cambridge Overseas School certificate. And once that was done, it was a roller coaster. I passed with a second class, which gave me an automatic qualification to go and study at Nile. And from then, it was it was never and scholarships just kept coming. Next slide. <clears throat> I wanted to start, I want to start with this. <clears throat> in my last lecture, I made reference to this book called African Voices in Education. In this book, I published this chapter titled African Philosophy and Educational Discourse. This chapter um, 20 years ago is a chapter through which I mapped out my ideas of Ubuntu very early on. Um, and I, I argued so eloquent. I'd just been to London and I think I was a bit frustrated because London was trying to socialize me into Western philosophy, continental philosophy, and I wanted to find myself and Ubuntu became an, an outlet where I can express my Africanness. So I basically, <clears throat> at VETS, probably will know, VETS is an historically white English liberal university. And then I went to London. <laughs> so I've actually been socialized into education. But when I came out of there, there was a need for me to discover who I am as an African. There was a there was a rebellion um, at Roma. I studied Franz Fanon. I studied Ngugi. Uh, I studied all African literature, Eskiam Pachele. And it is from that literature that I realized that there's so much richness that instead of being, as we say in South Africa, a coconut, a coconut is someone who is <laughs> brown or black on the outside, but white on the inside. So I needed to move away from them. In this chapter, I sat and reflected deeply and I wanted to talk about Ubuntu and I researched and I made very, very powerful statements that my view at the time, 20 years ago, I was able to articulate Ubuntu as a worldview. But I also wanted people who read my chapter to understand that as an African person, I was seeing Ubuntu from an indigenous epistemological point of view, which is why I described it as an indigenous African epistemology. But also that because it is an, an epistemology, it is a way of knowing, an African way of knowing. There are <clears throat> former professors of mine at VETS whom I argue on every daily basis because they want to separate the know-how and the know-what. And there's a saying that when you think in indigenous ways, we think in the know what, and I think it is wrong because we philosophize as Africans, we are critical. There are examples of indigenous chiefs like Muslim who were philosophers who never went to school, but who reason, who put philosophically tacit, rationally located arguments and made points. And the more I read about people like Muslim and Mushesh, I realized that there was so much richness. I, I did not just need to read Plato, Aristotle, or Nimalu and Kant, I could actually read our own traditional leaders and find semblances of very rich African epistemological pearls of wisdom in them. And out of that, I crafted the notion of Ubuntu and Ubuntu, I began to see it as a, um, a disposition that requires us to, to be humane. So I classify Ubuntu in that chapter uh, I make a case for Ubuntu as humaneness. And I, I argue that when we, we, we teach young people to embrace the philosophy of Ubuntu, we are trying to push them into the pursuit of humane disposition. What does it mean to be humane? To be humane is to think of the other and treat the other the way you would like the others to treat you. It's similar to the golden rule in the Bible, do unto others as you wish others to do unto thee. And Ubuntu is exactly that. To be human is to affirm one's humanity by recognizing the humanity of others. 
It's the same. It boils down to the same golden rule in the Bible. Do unto others as you wish others to do unto thee. Um, I think an Indian, an Indian pearl of wisdom uh, from the Hindi philosophy uh, is very harsh because it says that which is repugnant to you, do not wish it for others. It's the same. So if something is repugnant, you cannot wish others to experience that because it you detest it. If you detest it, why do you wish it for others? And it's the same philosophy that I think if we are asking young people to develop Ubuntu dispositions, if we love ourselves, can we then transpose that disposition of loving ourselves and love others the way we love ourselves? If we care for ourselves, can we then transpose that ethic of caring and care for others the way we want to be cared for? And for me, that, that just resembles the very fabric of what it means to be in pursuit of the philosophy of Ubuntu. Let's get to the next slide. I, I then, because, oh, no, not that one. <laughs> because I'm a philosopher, I look into all of these precepts that come out of the, the, the Ubuntu narratives, and I engaged. I was at Forte. I, I gave lots and lots of seminars. I generated debate at Forte as far as African philosophy and Ubuntu is, is concerned. I got people to read John S. Mudimbe and, and have seminars to say, what does Mudimbe say to us? And how can we take Mudimbe's ideas and fit them into our context and let this to be a guide that shapes how we think about one another as human beings. And out of that, I then crafted this view that Ubuntu is a normative concept. At a philosophical level, something is normative if it prescribes the norm, the way things ought to be, how we ought to relate to others. But I went further to say that as a normative concept, Ubuntu, in my view, captures so many things. It encapsulates normal moral norms such as um, kindness, generosity, um, benevolence, courtesy, respect, and again, concern for others. And there are citations there. If you go to that chapter, you go to 100, page 180, you'll see it there. But I also said that Ubuntu prescribes desirable and accepted forms of human conduct in a particular community of people. Someone asked me, what do you mean accepted? Accepted to who? <laughs> and I always argue that um, this, this liberal position of me, that we have values that are my values. When we live in communities, we have our values, but our values are subsumed within the values that the community we live in drives us to be. So we cannot be community people if we can then want to be our own individual people. And you'll see as we proceed through the lecture that there are lots and lots of examples throughout the African continent where uh, leaders in Africa and the entire African epistemological ways of looking at things locates an individual within the community. You are not alone. You are part of a community. If you are an individual, you become a microcosm of that community. So you don't think as an individual, but you think in the we. The we. Next slide. And that picture is a very popular picture, but it's a picture that basically uh, we see children here sitting around in a circle. But that, that, that sitting around in a circle is a very symbolic picture. It basically speaks about Ubuntu asking us to maintain what you call the unbroken circle. It's an unbroken circle of human relationships. So if I'm in a community, my, my being a member of, the, of that community should be embedded in the relationships that I find myself a part of. A person is a person through other persons. Mutu, I'm a Musutu, but I'm also, I grew up in a, in a township. Umuntu, Umuntu Gabantu, Mutu, Kimutu Gabantu. A person is never alone. A person is a person through other persons. Now, I argued in that chapter that Ubuntu il illuminates the communal embeddedness and connectedness of mm -hmm. persons to other persons. Amazingly, amazingly, I studied um, the works of uh, an English liberal, Isaiah Berlin. I mean, Isaiah Berlin, in one of his books, says, 
we are all interconnected. There's no way an individual can live their lives without their lives being impacted by their connectedness to other people. So we are not, Ubuntu is not something that is here. Even in Western liberal society, there are those ideas. Um, Michael McIntyre has written a book called After Virtue. In, in, in After Virtue, he, he basically counsels that I am someone else's father, I am someone else's brother, I'm someone else's uncle, I'm a brother to so-and-so, I'm a member of that particular guilt, I'm a member of that particular social framework. These social frameworks shapes who I am in a community where I am. These are examples of very clear classical Western philosophers who have recognized that Umundu, Umundu Gabantu, even within their own liberal philosophical disposition. So for me, there is a universality there in the saying Umundu, Umundu Gabantu. We are just saying it in our own, is seen to as Abantu from Africa. But when you go through these examples in Western philosophies, you see that there are universalities there. Uh, next slide. This, this is, this is a book by arguably one of my favorite philosophers. When I spoke at the, uh, the International Day of Living Together, I made reference to my formative years as an undergraduate student in Lesotho where I studied philosophy at the Anglican Missionary <laughs> Mission Station at, the, at, at Roma. And um, Mudimbe is a, is a Kenyan philosopher, but he's, a, he's also a theologian. And I was surprised when I got to Roma in 1978 that Mudimbe's books were there. We had to, to I'm saying, uh, 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 not Mudimbe, sorry, Mbiti. His books were there. We had to read them. And when I go back to Mbiti's works, I realize that Mbiti speaks to Ubuntu. Mbiti coined um, this, I call it um, uh, a mantra. I am because we are. And since we are, therefore, I am. Umuntu, umuntu gabantu. A person is a person through others. You can't be a person alone. You are a person because of your communal interconnectedness with others. And that interconnectedness, if uh, later on I'm going to try and bring this into the pandemic that we are in right now of COVID, it is that communal interconnectedness that asks us to be, to be caring to others, to be empathetic to others, to be generous to others, and, 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 and to intervene where we have, because we have a communal moral obligation to make sure that others around us don't suffer. We are all locked up, and people are frustrated with this, but when you look at this locked up in a bigger picture, it is an Ubuntu justice because it says, don't go out there and cause ill health, who should be repugnant, do not cause it to others, because when you do so, then you breach the very principles of Ubuntu, which is caring, empathy, you know, all this come together. So Mbiti basically goes on and say, the individual cannot exist alone, except corporately. You are part of a wider community. Uh, the individual owes their existence to other people, including even those that have departed. In Africa, we, we have ancestors, we don't have ghosts. People speak about ghosts and wishes. No, in, in Africa, we have ancestors. Um, in Lesotho, where I come from, if I have a misfortune here, my life is not well. I go home and we go through a ritual where we appeal to our ancestors. We don't call them dead people. We call them our ancestors. We have a, a ritual where we, we slaughter, we feast. That, that, that ritual is a ritual through which Slabela Amashlozi, we slaughter for the ancestors. It's a, it's a symbolic gesture to say, we appeal to our departed ones up there to come to our aid, to take all this bad luck off us and give us some light. And it's, it's who we are. It's our traditions. These are our cultures. Whatever happens to an individual, Mbiti says, happens to the whole group. And whatever happens to the whole group happens to the individual. There is the unbroken circle of humanities. Next slide, I'll be quick now. <laughs> yeah. um, again, um, I, I picked this up, those of you who are aware, this is a book written by the former 
president of Kenya, um, Jomo Kenyatta. Yeah. And, and in that, a very powerful, Jomo Kenyatta takes the whole notion, but he locates us within his own ethnic group, the Kikuyu. And he says, in, in, in his Kikuyu community, um, in Kikuyu ways of thinking, nobody is an isolated individual. Rather, their uniqueness is a secondary fact about them. First and foremost, they are several people's relatives, and they are several people's contemporaries. People are closely interconnected with one another in a lifestyle oriented to the other. That statement is very powerful. It again brings that element of umuntu, umuntu gabantu. It brings the element in Viti, I am because you are, and because we are, therefore I am. So, you and these are examples that says when you go throughout Africa, you find this, these, these are fabrics of cultural orientations that makes us to get oriented to one another. Next slide, I'll be quick. <clears throat> I spoke about this last, last time, that when you break all the statements that I've said, in Ubuntu, we see a particular ethics of care. Ubuntu wants us to embrace the ethic of care. We need to care for humanity. I care for Daddy John Romnick, I care for Monica, and in turn, I expect Monica, even where she is, to care for my well-being. Where I grew up in Lesotho, when we get up in the morning, we greet Dumela, Inkosa, Molo, Inzulu, Saubona. I see you. You have woken up. And the first question is, how are you? It's called, in English, we call it fatty communion. It may not mean anything, but it expresses the fact that I may have slept in a different room, but when I wake up, I'm concerned about your well-being. How are you? Did you sleep well? Are you well? Can we then together work and see this day together? That's exactly why Ubuntu is all about. And mm -hmm. when we meet people in the streets, I'm old now, I'm over 60. When I meet young people, I say, hi, how are the children? How are the grandchildren? It's the way we are. We are concerned about the well-being of others. And that concern is encapsulated in that particular ethics of care that Yusuf Wahid and Paul Smears articulate. When you look at it like that, then Ubuntu is a moral theory, but Ubuntu is a, is a worldview. It wants us to exercise compassion, to respect others, to recognize people's human dignity, but also it wants us to be constantly closer to one another. The former chief, the former judge of the High Court in, in, in South Africa, Justice Yvonne Mukhoro, says it's a humanistic orientation towards others and a collective unity. Professor Ramose, my compatriot at Inisa, says it's a philosophy that seeks to promote kinship, connectedness among people. It wants us to be humane. It's about being a humane, respectful, and polite, and having polite attitudes towards others. It's a very powerful philosophy. It's a philosophy, um, I think, if you, we can link it to Western philosophy, I see elements of stoicism in Ubuntu. We need to embrace that stoic, stoic philosophy that says, I don't live for myself, I live for others, and I expect others to live for me so that we create a collective of care. Next slide. There is Professor Ramose. I'll be quick about this. Professor Ramose is a very powerful person. He has written so many books. That book is a very, very important book, um, African Philosophy Through Ubuntu. He says Ubuntu is simultaneously the foundation and the edifice of African philosophy. Eh? It's, it is the specific entity which continues to conduct an inquiry into becoming. When we are Africans, we speak about Ubuntu. We are trying to become. It's being and becoming. John Paul Sartre, all these philosophies come together, being and, you know, <laughs> so you see it in there. As Ubuntu as being humane, a humane, respectful, and polite attitude towards others. Next slide. So Ramosa says uh, it's a philosophy of being in the world of the living, and uh, you must be an Ubuntu in order to be it's a response to the challenges or the fundamental instabilities of being. That's powerful. Next slide. Right. I, I made reference to the ethics of care. Uh, Professor Vromik, you realize this is now 
you are your provincial countryman. A close friend of mine, uh, Professor Yusuf Wahid at the University of Stellenbosch, him and I are considered some of the few people who are in the forefront writing about Ubuntu. Professor Wahid has written this book called African Philosophy um, in, the, in, in, in Education. And he says he regards Ubuntu as a, as a humanistic concept. And he says, as a humanistic concept, Ubuntu in, 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 in genders cooperative and harmonious human relationships. As a philosophical concept, Ubuntu contributes towards cultivating respect and care that are required to produce a morally worthwhile African society. Now, I grew up in an African household where I was one of the eight siblings. <laughs> in, that, in that huge family, you would expect challenges, but I experienced Ubuntu where parents, our parents loved us all for who we are, and they created that family unit. A parent has to care for each one. But I grew up in a community where my parents were not necessarily my biological parents. The elders in the community were my parents. They could reprimand me. They wanted to see me move in the right direction. Every parent was responsible for the well-being, growth, and conduct of each child. We have a saying in Africa that a child doesn't belong to his family, but a child is brought up by the community. And the community of elders, that's where all the collective wisdom is tapped into to ensure that a child gets guided accordingly. You can't go wrong when you have all the community of elders coming in say, this is right, this is wrong, this is appropriate, this is inappropriate, this is what you ought to do, this is what you ought not to do. Next slide. I brought this up because in 2015, I was, I was a member of the Comparative International Education Society. For those who do not know, um, Professor Ndri Asi Lumumba, she will appear in the next slide. She was appointed, she's actually from Benin, and she's a colleague of mine. Uh, I spoke to you, Professor um, Volmik, to say I just completed a chapter to a book Professor Ndri Asi Lumumba is, 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 is editing. And in there, I've written this chapter on educating Ubuntu, educating for Ubuntu in global discourses. How do we use Ubuntu to, to develop global discourses where people can begin to see us as part of the bigger world. The, the society decided to launch a conference in, in Washington, D.C., and I'm one of the people who gave presentation in that conference. We chose the theme Ubuntu, imagining a humanistic education globally. Isn't it the same thing that EPUB is doing now? Isn't it the same thing that the Ubuntu Global Network is doing now? And these things have now been explored at another level. So I'm now a member of a bigger society to this one, which is called the World Comparative Council for Educational Society. And I'm a member of the executive. We're still continuing with this book that we are, we are, we are talking about, Pursues Ubuntu. The, the, the call for conference Envision. There was a vision there, a vision of a humanistic education that is in harmony with Ubuntu. We call delegates from Latin America, delegates from the East Asia, delegates from Africa, delegates from Europe, delegates from America. We congregated them and say, let's have a conversation about how we can draw on Ubuntu to begin to frame our own conceptions of education. And we, re we, we eventually released a special issue in UNESCO's International Review of Education. There, there is a special issue where these papers that we're publishing there are now out there to be read. And, and I'll share them with, with you, Prof. Volmi, so that it can be part of that, to show that we have now engaged Ubuntu at a global level. And we ask the delegates there to imagine an education that fosters a future that reflects Ubuntu and engages in a process of deconstruction of prevailing modernist epistemology. Modernist epistemologies that see the individual as in Deca, I think, therefore I am. We are moving away from there. No, we think, therefore we are. <laughs> Next slide. There is, there is Prof. Ndri Asilumumba. I'm not going to say much about her. She's also one of the co-editors of that book that I started with, uh, African Voices in Education. She's now based in, in Cornell University. She's driving the Ubuntu um, discourses. She was asked by Codestria 
to write a report on the challenges of higher education in Africa. And she cited my chapter to say, we need to look even at African education on the African continent through the lenses of Ubuntu. That's exactly the key. Next slide. <clears throat> right. This is, this is a paper that I, I, I think I share this paper with you, Prof. Romick and the team. This mm -hmm. paper, um, in 2013, I'd been working around Ubuntu. Someone asked me, Prof, you are talking a lot about Ubuntu, but we've never taken us through how can we then build Ubuntu in our pedagogies? How do we teach using the principles of Ubuntu? So I, I thought about that and I went back and looked at my pedagogy. I was at Forte at the time, which is a small university in the Eastern Cape, popular because people like Nelson Mandela, Govan Becky, Robert Mugabe, uh, Kenneth Kaunda, these are people who have studied there. It's a very historic institution with a huge legacy. I taught there for 10 years and it's, it's in a rural, rural Eastern Cape and I was able to see how rural communities are. And I wrote this chapter to say, how do I educate for Ubuntu in that rural environment? So this paper is titled Educating for Ubuntu, but I draw on examples from Basutu indigenous education. But in that paper, I underscore the importance of exposing young people to the wider world and to different cultures or what can be known as cosmopolitanism. I, I have been using the world, the work of um, an American philosopher by the name of Martha Nussbaum. Martha Nussbaum has written quite lovely pieces on cosmopolitan education. But in the chapter, in the paper, I argue that if educating for Ubuntu was to focus on the local African or indigenous and preclude exposure to what the rest of the world has to offer, then I would regard such an education as simplistic, as parochial, as anti-educational and not worthwhile pursuing. So I put my head on the board that we can still teach young people to embrace their own cultures and traditions, but we also owe it to ourselves to show the young people that the world is bigger than my village in Lesotho. The world is bigger than my township in Katleho. The world is bigger than this Pretoria is where I am. We are part of the global community. And this is why I feel indebted. I'm wearing this T-shirt proudly. I'm wearing it with pride because I know that IPAF is doing exactly what I'm saying. IPAF is taking Ubuntu and is, is basically throwing the seeds of Ubuntu across the world. And I can only imagine what would happen if the world begins to see Ubuntu for the way I'm just talking about it here. Next slide. There, look at that title. Now, um, I use this title, this book, to, to teach my students to say, when we, when we talk about Ubuntu, we, we, are, we are engaging in an endeavor where we are cultivating humanity through global ways of looking at the world. Martha Nasbom says, to be a citizen of the world, listen to this, this is very, very important. For you to be a citizen of the world, one does not need to give up local identifications, which can frequently be a source of great richness in life. Instead, we should think of ourselves not, not as devoid of local affiliations. Our local affiliations feed into who we are. I grew up in the township, I grew up in Lesotho, but I found myself walking in Tottenham Court Road in London. <laughs> I found myself walking in Honolulu or in New York City. I'm a global person, but I owe my roots to that township in Katleo. I owe my roots to that village in Lesotho, but that doesn't pre preclude me from being a citizen of the world. Next slide. And this, this will be quick. This will be very, very quick. In 2014, I spoke about it last time. I, was, I, was, I received a grant to study, to study Ubuntu in Southern Africa. Can you go quickly? Let me show the, the, next, the, next, the next slide quickly. Right, here it is. It's called, it's called a, a National Research Foundation funded study that ran in actually Southern Africa. I had two researchers working in Botswana. My wife and I, my late wife and I were working in Lesotho. That's where there's a Lesotho flag. I had two young people, Pro Volnik, one of the young women in Namibia had just completed her PhD from the University of the Western Cape. And that's how mm -hmm. I met. 
I had two young people working in Swaziland. I had two young people working in Zambia. These are my masters and doctoral students who are, are now doctors and they are my researchers. I had two others working in Zimbabwe. And next slide, we also ran the study in South Africa. Next slide. We ran the study in South Africa in the five provinces, the Eastern Cape, KwaZulu Natal, Mpumalanga, Dimpopo, and Northwest. So basically, there were 24 entities, 11, 11 teams of people that were working on Ubuntu. What were we doing here in this? This was a, a study that was based on my understanding of oral history. I had read um, um, that Congolese um, scholar, Valentin Mudimbe. Now, Valentin Mudimbe counsels very well in, in his book on African philosophy. And what caught me in that book was to say, every time a community elder dies, we lose a valuable library of indigenous forms of knowing. I'll repeat that. Every time a community elder dies, we lose a very powerful resource in terms of the indigenous knowledge system. So I titled that study, uh, The Archaeology of Ubuntu, because I wanted to send the team to the communities to speak to the community. We spoke to elders who are between my age, 65 and 80, and we were saying to them, here we are, we are trying to get young people to be good persons. Here we are, we are trying to be, to get our communities to be responsive to one another. What are your notions of Ubuntu? And we got rich responses. Elderly people gave, this was an oral historical journey. Now, how do I pull all these things together? I've spoken loads and loads of things about Ubuntu. I'll go back to the key. The key is Ubuntu wants us to be generous as a philosophy. Ubuntu wants us to be humane to one another. Ubuntu wants us to respect human dignity. But Ubuntu wants us to exercise elements of benevolence. Ubuntu wants us to be, to be humane. And these are, these are, for me, the moral qualities that we need now when we are caught up in this pandemic that has forced everybody else to be confined. Someone said to me, I don't take alcohol. But once in a while, I enjoy a glass of wine. But now that I can't even have that glass of wine, I'm suffering from withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> this is the time. <laughs> this is the time when Ubuntu needs to play a very critical role in saying, how do we draw on all these values that I've just outlined, so that we can then say, here we are, Ubuntu, Ubuntu Gabantu. We are all suffering, but you're not suffering alone. You are not alone in this world. Jomo Kinyata says, you are, you are with others. Eh? Umuntu, umuntu kabantu. I am because we are. And since we are, therefore, since I am, therefore we are. We are all in this together. But it calls, it calls for us to, to be responsive to even a bigger picture. And I'll explain what that means. At UNISA, Professor Makanya has started a fund. He has asked us senior people to say, what is the role of UNISA? in COVID-19. What can we, UNISA academics, uh, contribute? So he, he basically um, implored, and I want to use the word implore, he didn't force us, he appealed to us. He appealed to us to say, it's important that because we understand the deeper magnitude of where we are, can we all make modest contributions in our salary? So each one of us at UNISA, are uh, pledging a certain amount of money to the COVID relief fund that comes from UNISA. And these are funds I'm sure that are going to be pulled to, to add to what the president is doing in his own COVID. So we have these monies and these monies are supposed to assist us to intervene when as there's so much poverty, you are aware that in most of our, 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 our townships, there are deliveries of food puzzles because people are hungry, people are not working, people don't have access. This is where Ubuntu wants us to demonstrate that sense of goodwill, the maturity that we care. We know that we are not alone, we are with others, and we have a moral obligation to be there for those that can't. If I can, then I must be there for those that can't. That's where my humane element comes to play its role. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Litseka. You know, while you were speaking, <clears throat> I've made a, a note or two here 
but I'm always interested in listening to somebody who owns his own story. Thank you. And you own it. Thank and you. That Thank story you. starts yeah, here in South Africa via Lesotho, then coming to work in the mines in South Africa. And, you know, in the Ubuntu Academy, we put a lot of value on the one pillar, resilience. Yes. And I can see so much resilience. I mean, if I, I cannot imagine putting myself in your shoes, working underground <laughs> and having an aspiration that one day I'll be a distinguished professor of philosophy. And here I am. <laughs> and there you are. And I, I have to say that I'm inspired by your story. Thank you very and much. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. And I'm proud of the fact that you're a South African with me. But also, all our, growing up here in South Africa, a place where we were prevented from becoming participants Absolutely. in the choices that affect our lives. Mm. You know, I'm not sure to what extent that was a choice when you were six years old, being carried off to the no. and then being, and then the 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 trouble of the 60s and the 70s. Yeah. yeah. I must say, uh, you know, today, whatever happened in your life, whatever the journey was that went through, today it's produced a wonderful human being. And to, we have this opportunity of looking you in the eye and saying, we really admire you as a human being because you are Ubuntu. You live it. Thank you. Uh, when Monica and I and Rui came to your office, you went out of your way. You must have been tired. But you I just landed from Dubai. I just yeah. landed in the morning from Dubai. <laughs> yes, yeah. And, and there you were. And I, you know, it's almost too good to be true, but it is sincere. So you. you live Ubuntu. And when you began to speak about Ubuntu, it's got to do with the ethics of care, Absolutely. of kindness. Uh, the spirit of generosity, respect, all of that we see in you. So so thank you for being such an inspiration to us. I, I just want to take up two issues um, with you. And the one is uh, colonialism and post-colonialism. And the other issue is, and I would like to end with that, is what lessons can we draw from the life of Nelson Mandela as a person who had Ubuntu? Yeah. And I say that simply because <clears throat> come July 18th, we're going to celebrate his birthday. Mm -hmm. And Mandela Day is a day of a, a global call to action, to, which inspires us to be uh, what he had set an example for the whole world. Now, this, uh, uh, this, uh, I know we don't have enough time to go through all the detail, but if you think about where we are, so we had colonialism, but before colonialism, mm -hmm. there was uh, Africa in its natural state, mm -hmm. and now we're in post colonialism, and where we've lost a lot, not only the world, but we as Africans have lost a lot of what we were. And so Ubuntu, I was interested in what you were saying. Ubuntu is a narrative of return. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it takes us back. Now, the challenge is, and, I, and, and you said that, and what you said was Ubuntu is almost a way that tells us how life ought to be, how we ought to be in the world. And, uh, and so the challenge is the colonial period has not left us unscarred. Absolutely. There was a time when uh, uh, colonialism together with nationalism uh, from, from foreign countries have unilaterally declared who we are as Africans, mm -hmm. um, 
primitive and irrelevant. Barbaric. And, yeah. Yes. And, and, and barbaric and even evil. Mm -hmm. And so who we are got replaced. And so now when I say a narrative of return, we need to return to not only sure. being African, but also being human. Sure. I hope I... That, yes, the post-COVID world is a is a world, a narrative of return, mm. going back for the whole world to reclaim its humanity. Mm. 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 I I grew up in Lesotho. Um, let me let me go back to the decision by my parents, and I'm glad you raised that. Um, as a six year old. I, I I couldn't consent. My parents assented, and I'm 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 not I'm not I don't regret what my, our parents did. In hindsight, my mother told me when I was at varsity that she doesn't she's not sorry that she uprooted us from the township and took us to Lesotho because she didn't think that if we were still in the township we would have received the education. Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland were then called High Commission territories. Mm. But they were British colonies. Let's be frank about it. Mm. Mm. And um, um, I, I, I lived, I lived in that. I, I lived through the period when we used to celebrate um, British independence. We used to march and celebrate the King George's, the Queen Elizabeth. But then you know that in 1966, the spirit of nationalism came in. Lesotho obtained its independence. I, I, I was a youngster. I observed that, and I could see the euphoria. Don't worry about what followed. The postcoloniality is all over Africa. Postcolonialism brought something. Africans simply, postcoloniality is not a very wonderful uh, era to speak about in Africa because it showed Africans can be something else. But I lived yeah. through that. Um, what I do now at UNISA, <clears throat> um, I, I run a series of seminars on the coloniality and, and Africanization. There's a program called the Young Academics Program. We simply abbreviate it, YAPS. And I'm regular. I get I get called in maybe twice a year. I speak to young people. And Prof. Von Nick, it, it saddens me. It saddens me. I'm a student of history. Um, at metric, at Cambridge Overseas School Certificate, history is one of the, the subjects where I got a credit. I actually got a, got a four. So I, I, I was good at history which is why when I got to university, I studied history, I studied political science. My dissertation at Roma was in history. I normally ask a question to my young academics. These are young people who have master's degrees, who have studied PhDs, and the young academic problem is a way where we inspire them with these talks and we, we educate them. I always say before I start, especially in, in, in Africanization and decolonial, I always ask how many of you here have studied history? And to my shock and horror, you'll find there's probably one or two. And there are normally people who come from Botswana or who come from Zimbabwe, but not here. Because in this country, we have never prioritized history. And yet history is very critical to getting young people to understand the very same, you know, you just caught up um, uh, some historical narratives. I mean, yeah. we, are, we are reading now on Facebook, one of my students is doing, has opened up a debate about the distortions of the story of non -Kaus. Not many people know who non -Kaus is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they read what white historians tell us about it. So I'm yeah. saying to my students, when we, we Africanize, when we call for the coloniality, when I stand before you and I speak about Ubuntu, my, my only word, there's only one word, it's, it's, it's reclamation. In Ubuntu, we are reclaiming. We want to reclaim who we are. And I said to my students, I'm not asking you to go back to the bush and dress in, oh, and have spears and kill each other. No, I wanted mm -hmm. to rec you to recognize your cultural roots and know who you are, but also remember that you now live in a modernized, Manuel Castell spoke about a, a network society. That's who we are. You can't change the fact that the world we live in is networked, but then you and I, as senior citizens, will have failed the young people if we cannot encourage them to go back, to go back to the roots. Um, that Guinea um, philosopher wrote um, a book called Return to the Source, uh, Amelka Cabral. Oh, yeah. 
Yes. And I, I always say to them, read Amilka Cabral, return to the source. It was it was political, but if you use that metaphor, return home, mm. I still I still go to Lesotho now and then. I still go to Natal Street now and then. Those are those mm. are my sources. That's where I get such we teach we 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 need to continue to teach young people to understand. Martha Nasbom says you can be a cosmopolitan person, but you also need to recognize and respect your roots. Your original, your your roots are very important because they shape who you are. Once you come out of there as a strong person, you are now prepared to see the world for what it is. You can't go into the world and be and persevere and succeed if you do not have roots that shape who you are. You take that formative education from your roots, it becomes the ammunition that then assists you to navigate your way into the world. When I first walked in London in 1995 for the first time, it was this big city, but of course I know Johannesburg, I've been to Cape Town, it's a city like any other city, but I was able to walk in there comfortable as a black person, but also knowing that this is a country that invaded my continent. <laughs> I'm not apologizing to be here. I've come to reclaim what's mine. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now, let's talk about well, post-coloniality. Yes. Post-coloniality, basically, it's, it's a sad story because this is what I'm doing right now. We, we need people to think that we need to go back and Africanize, but we need to also get them to decolonize. Um, Ngugi speaks about decolonizing the mind. Um, Linda Smith, in Auckland, speaks about decolonizing methodologies. It's a book about how do we, there's an indigenous movement happening in the Australasia, very powerful. In fact, um, we are now, I'll share with you, we are, we, are, we are working on a project to see how we can we can create a database of decolonization with the, the Australasian uh, indigenous system. There is decolonizing research methodology by Linda to Hawaii Smith. Basically, how do we look at epistemologies from our own African perspectives, not to look at epistemologies as dictated to us by Western major narratives. How do we make our own indigenous epistemologies major narratives that define our world the way we want our world to be understood? We cannot allow our world to be defined for us by other people. That's not how it is. And this is why Ubuntu is a way of saying, how do we redefine our Africanness so that others can understand us as our story, our narrative, who we are. I'm not perfect. I cannot speak for Africans, but I speak about myself as a Musoto. I speak about my understanding. You can speak about it, but as a collective, we share one thing. The whole root of Ntu that you find across defines who we are. Right. It's the basis yeah. of Ubuntu, Abantu, Watu, Vutu. You find it anywhere else. It defines who we are. It's a linguistic phenomenon. Yes. Beautiful. Uh, I, I also recall the words of Desmond Tutu. Uh -huh. uh, he says, the concept of Ubuntu is saying a person has a proper self-assurance <clears throat> that comes from knowing that he or she belongs in the greater whole and is diminished when others are humiliated or diminished when others are tortured or oppressed. So we are connected. Your whole, your whole, the thread of your presentation was about interconnectedness. That diminishing and, and, element you raise, you'll find yes. it again in Desmond Tutu. If, yes. if I diminish you, I diminish myself. There you go. Yes. This is, this is a Tutu quote, yes. Yes. <laughs> so maybe... Maybe we can end uh, tonight. I wish we had two hours, but yes, I our, time, our time has now expired. But I sure. really want to ask you uh, one of the greatest leaders, not only of our era, but in history, lived in this country with us. Yes. Although 27 years in imprisonment. But he inspired all of us. Absolutely. And if you look at Nelson Mandela, Prof. Etzeka, and you want to hold up the most important trait for you uh, of what represents Ubuntu in Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. how, would you, how would you describe that? 
look, I, I have a lot of things to say about about Utata, mm. a lot of things to say. But I want I want to go back and I, allow me. I don't know how much time I have. Um, and yeah. when when Nelson Mandela came out of jail, everybody else expected the man who had been removed from society unlawfully to come out angry and to come and wage war. But we know that when Nelson Mandela came out of jail, even after having been incarcerated for 27 years, but when he came out of jail, the one thing that defined him was not anger, it was not hate. No, it was forgiving, it was for rebuilding. It was humility. It was to say, it's a past, yes, it's a past that is with me. But he, he didn't allow the incarceration to turn him into an angry person, and we can learn a lot from that. You will remember, you will remember that Nelson Mandela um, did something quite extraordinary and went and had tea with the wife of Hendrik Fervut, yes. the very same person who, mm. the husband who basically was an architect of a system that sent Mandela to the gallows for 27 years. And having, having tea with Mefro Fervut was to say, I'm here, we are here, we are about to, can we, can we share, can we move forward? For me, that gesture, I know, I know Zapiro coined a cartoon about Mandela as an elastica bending over backwards, mm. giving her <laughs> a cup of tea. But but yeah. it epitomizes the man. Where else do we see the spirit of Mandela? Most people um don't realize that one of the things that, that humbles me about Nelson Mandela has always been his love for children. Yeah. I mean, this the Nelson Mandela Day, he always he always celebrated it, his birthday. He always made it a point that he celebrates it with children. Yes. Because it is in children that he saw the future. And we can learn a lot from that. When I see, I spoke last time and I, I looked at the people that I was speaking to in IPAV, they are young people. For me, I was I was humbled for the fact that I had a platform to speak to young people. Yes. It, this is it. Mandela yes. taught us that the younger <laughs> people are a future. But we shouldn't forget that out of all that, Mandela taught us that there isn't anything more important than reconciliation. Mm. You reconcile. Margaret yes. Thatcher was notorious for calling Mandela a terrorist. But mm. Mandela went to on a state visit to the UK and to Buckingham Palace, and one of the persons he wanted to see was Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Even though Margaret Thatcher had bundled him and, and, and characterized him as a, as, as a terrorist, you know, but he there he met her and they had cordial discussion. We can learn a lot from that. I think yeah. there was, if you speak about Ubuntu, Nelson Mandela epitomizes that in practice. He, he he's was a basically, he's, yeah. a, he's, he's a symbol of Ubuntu in practice. His whole life was a, sim, yeah. a symbolic practice and exemplification of Ubuntu. We couldn't ask yeah. for more. He became the bridge Absolutely. between between us. So thank he you. was a big builder. Yeah, so uh, we, we do, I want to end by thanking you, but also asking you, in your very interesting life. <laughs> thank you. That, that you've lived, a, a very unique one. Um, thank you. Uh, and symbolizes so many different things. What for you was a defining moment in your life that changed the direction and maybe also your mental approach to life. Is there a defining moment that you can recall? When I studied migrancy at the National University of Lesotho, two people were critical. I mentioned Professor Jeff Guy. Mm. I know Jeff. But there was a, there was a young Kenyan who was completing his master's and he became my teaching, teaching assistant. He introduced me to political philosophy. Rock Ajulu, you know him. He just, he just died about two years ago. Professor yes. Ajulu, he spent a lot of time at, uh, at Rhodes and he became my, my colleague here at UNISA. Professor Jeff Guy 
um, introduce us to the, the economics of migrants in South Africa. And as a, as a university student, I look back, study migrancy now. Um, who was this gentleman at West University of the Western Cape um, who produced one of those cutting papers? Um, anyway, I'll remember that. But Jeff Guy and Ajulu Rock opened my eyes. They they took me through um, the, 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 the economic analysis of South, Af South Africa through migrancy. And then I look back, they were talking about me. We, we read the books of Luli Kalinikos. If you open Gold and the Miners, there is a picture there of naked men by the wall being mm. medically examined. And I tell people, I was one of those men. Wow. And so for me, if you ask for a defining moment in my life, I think my mining experience, I think my mining experience was pivotal. I went there as a naive young person, but I think out of that experience in the mine, as a university student, as an intellectual, I look back at it and I said, it was it was the horror of apartheid exploitation of perceived cheap labor. I sat I sat in a psychology in a whole warehouse where we were being psychoanalyzed. People were given puzzles. Now you know when you haven't been to school. A puzzle is, is a maze. These are huge puzzles that you and I, because we have mm -hmm. logic, I think I fitted, they, they started with 10 pieces. I fitted those, raised my hand, they were done. They brought 15, I fitted those. Raised. Some yeah. people at the end of two hours, they, still, they were still struggling with 10. They didn't yeah. understand. It's, yeah. You understand that? Yeah. But, but then I learned that this is exactly where Karl Marx and the exploitation of the proletariat and workers is all about. The mining industry showed me how the system of exploitation is. And I learned that I went through that, I survived that. And I was able to go back and study it at a university and look at it for what it is. It's, it's, a, system, it's a system that ordinary people in the village thought it was an opportunity for them to go and work. I was paid one run, 70 runs, a shift of eight hours as a semi-trained person. The rest of the people were being paid 50 cents, a shift of eight hours underground. That's the classic case of exploitation of the workers. And I look at it, I look at it and I, th I think I, it's, it, it defined me because I realized that when I moved out of the mine after one year, I was a winch driver. People said I was now ready to be made a bus boy. I was supposed to rise. And I said, no, I'm not here for this. And I thank God that even at that stage, I was able to make that decision to say, this is not the well for me. But it defined, it, it was the most defining moment because I looked at that and I thought, if there are some people who live their whole life under these exploitative conditions, and that's how they feed their families, and they think this is the best because that's the only thing that they can offer, then we have a lot of work to do. And when I went to Resorto to study and go to university, I knew that there's not in I wish, I wish that other people would go to the mines with the mindset that I had that I'm going to be here for a year, I'm going to get money, and then I'm going to pay for my Cambridge Overseas School certificate. And from then on, I would go. If many people were to do that, it for me, it would it, it would solve issues. So the mining, the mining experience was really critical for me because I I, I became exposed to the most brutal not only mm. that it 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 uprooted men from home but it, it it promised it gave people promises of a better life but no it was just a drudge of living from hand to mouth but generating millions and millions and millions of runs for the system that didn't care for the majority and i'll give an example um the platinum workers in in rustenberg went on strike amku one of the things that, that upset me because I understand the mine, he didn't work at it. When the platinum mine said they cannot afford Amku's request for increase in salary. And yet, and yet, they paid the mining CEO 17 million runs a year, one person. Now, do you understand that? 
Yeah. One person, the, the mind can set aside a salary of 17 million rands for one individual, but they don't see it as necessary yeah. to increase the salaries of people. Check us. Mm. Check us, this supermarket. They they are one of the people that hire people at exploitative level. One of the CEO retired last year. They gave him a golden handshake of 100 million rands. One person. So do you understand what I'm talking about? Obscene yes. monies that are being given to individuals, but the rest of the people who deserve our Ubuntu in terms of leveling the playing field and equalizing and making sure that we raise the life, those are not concerns. So we enrich, they're already rich and it's okay. So the mining industry taught me that it's a it's a defining moment, and I see semblances of that. Mm. Um mm. I won't mention names, but the former CEO of APSA also walking away with, with 20. I, I, yeah. I can't say more, you know. Yes. There yes. you go. Well, uh, Prof. Tekka, thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity not only to look into the mind of a brilliant academic, but look into his heart and into his soul. So thank you, thank you for sharing yourself with us. And and that as an act, that act is an act of generosity, an act of uh, uh, of care, and and so I know that you're a, a, a brilliant scholar, and I know you're a, a, a renowned speaker, uh, speaking in different parts of the world. But tonight, I leave this talk with a conviction that you're also part of the Ubuntu Academy and that your yeah. future and our future. Look at are, this. Yeah. So we are it's together it. as we walk the long walk to freedom. Freedom. Ubuntu. Yes. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.